welcome to another episode of um, Inspiring Technology and um, Stories of Success. Um, today we're doing it a little bit differently. Um, we don't have CEOs, CTOs or CIOs in the room from a technical perspective. But um, this is a person that I wanted to speak to for such a long time, Owen Murray. Um, Owen is now the head of uh, TA in Protex AI and you have worked in every capacity um, in attracting talent um, over your 20 year plus um, career. So welcome to the show or webinar. I Thanks the podcast. Jason, so, yeah. good to have you. Very flattering intro, very, very good. <laughs> uh, nice offices too, it's good to be here. It's good to be in person doing these things as well, I find. But yeah, thanks for having us. Um, I'm looking forward to the conversation. I love what we do in TA yeah. or agency. I just love recruitment and helping out these people find their careers. So yeah. I'm all yours as to what you want to pick. Hopefully I'll have the answers. <laughs> nah, of course, of course. Now listen, again, I think um, maybe because I'm sitting on my side of the fence, maybe TA or talent um, acquisition or if we're looking at um, agency, are we as you know seen in the, the recruitment process? Um, and I just want to get that out there to somebody that has been there, done it for you know a good bit of time, good chunk of time. Mm. Um, and you know, let's let's see where we take it. So um, can you take me back to the start? So when like, how did you get into recruitment? Most people say I fell into it, didn't know what it was, but uh, can you remember how, how you landed into recruitment? I'd say 50-50 between choice and falling into it. Uh, I was an engineer previously, um, uh, producing software, and it was CD-ROMs at the time, master, master disks, <clears throat> and Microsoft was one of our clients. So I went into Microsoft, I'd say for about six months, and I discovered I was a pretty awful engineer. Yeah. And, uh, <laughs> I, I, I knew tech then to a degree, but I had RAID databases here, I had SQL statements here, and I was trying to plug it all together, and I'm definitely more people-driven. Yeah. Uh, it became obvious even back then, it was probably only 19, 20. But um, a friend of mine was in recruitment uh, in the city centre here, and he said, it's great, I just talk to people all day and get them jobs. And he said, you'd be able to do that for, for technical people. And so then, ironically, I joined a company in Castle Street office, where I am with Protex, only just started two weeks ago. But I joined them around, giving my age away now, but uh, yeah. around two years, years ago. Yeah, a few yeah. years ago, yeah. A few years ago. Yeah. And uh, I remember. Was that just as the dot com, uh, dot, uh, com bubble burst that time? Or yeah. Was it just the wave? Was, was, was the wave still up? And then it was. What, what, it was what up were, like what, 90s. So, yeah. yeah um, it was up in the 90s, late 90s. Yeah. Mobile was just in it. I remember faxing CVs. I remember smoking in the office. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> so, the good very Glen Gary, Glen Ross. But I cut yeah. my teeth then in the recruitment. I realised it's uh, it's about doing the things that you don't like doing a lot, and then really enjoying the things when they when they come through that you do like doing. Brilliant. So uh, yeah, that was great. And did that's you, where tech it. recruitment was. That where you started in tech technology recruitment. Yeah, um, and then just had your love for it, and then drove on from there. Yeah. I was doing a lot of work back then. It was like systems analysts, project managers, business analysts, um, all on-premise kind of yeah. stack software applications. Not even applications. There wasn't even really apps. It's just big, clunky ERP systems yeah. being developed yeah. for all walks of life. And then there were some indigenous software companies like Iona was one of the big ones here. Um, yeah. Trinity uh, spin out. Motorola as well were probably big back then. Motorola as well. here, yeah. Ga Gateway as well was another. Gateway computers. Big, yeah, they were very well. hardware. It was more software focused. Yeah, because yeah, yeah, I, yeah, I remember it. Yeah, I remember it. I was a kid then. <laughs> yeah. But I remember uh, the, the, the kind of. Yeah, I can remember it. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I can remember the, um, the tech landscape probably back then. And then yeah. obviously it evolved crazy over like your lifetime in, in recruitment. So mm -hmm. um, what it brings me back on, like what, what is the, the biggest changes that you've seen in the industry from day one to now? It's a, a big question, but yeah, if you yeah, can give look, me the roadmap. Um, how long, how long like. do you have? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, a lot. There's like, like I said there, mobile was just coming in, uh, 56k modem dial up for internet. Um, after that, there's, there's change in technologies, change in softwares and, and data platforms all behind this all the way along. Um, your VB, your PHP, your Raspberry Pis, your, everything is thrown into the mix. And then, and then cloud hit and that just, uh, that just kind of exploded. But as we were discussing beforehand, didn't it explode straight away. It was kind of, oh, what is AWS, you know, is it useful and all that? But then became very prevalent, obviously. And, 
brings us up to the other you know novelties that we have today and the other advancements yeah um, and then brings us up to where we are like with the blockchains and the ais and all so the biggest changes i suppose have been the um have been the platform changes there's a lot of sophistication in uh, the disciplines behind it like the data science machine learning um but the biggest changes i've witnessed certainly have been the platform changes i think okay it's fair to say Brilliant. And then from the outside looking in, because I, I obviously knew of you in the industry and, and you know, what you were doing, um, and it probably brings me through to, like, you know, the, the different companies that you work for. So can you give us an idea of, like, you know, some of those um, types of companies that you worked for and the, the, the highlights then around it? So you were, how long were you in an agency? Were you working in agency for long? Or can you, um, how that looked? I think about three or four years in agency. It was about two and a half years of that first one in Zenith. And, um, and then I went, there, were, there is a stint in my career where I did teaching as a foreign language. I said, oh, I'm burnt out. So I chose to uh, teach English to foreign uh, students. Brilliant. Uh, both here and abroad for about three or four years. Whereabouts did you go to do that? Uh, the aim was to go to Japan, but I only got as far as the UK. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Personal circumstance. Yeah, yeah. But I um, really enjoyed that. And then, uh, but I still, I still love the recruiter game. So I got back into it. And uh, I started my own business as well uh, for about, Two and a half, three years, I was working with, you know, the big systems integrators, some of the blue chips like Sage Software and stuff like that. Yeah. Had a few contractors on my books. It was it was a nice business, but I do I do prefer being part of a team. Um and then I went into um where is I where did I go next? It's a while ago. I had a sales and marketing role for a while in CRM because that was two thousand I think two thousand and eight, that was another dip in yeah, the yeah, of course, yeah. So I, I unwisely chose a sales role, but anyway, um, yeah, and I went, I went back into recruitment then in-house uh, with PopCap Games. They were acquired by EA. Yeah, yeah. Um, they were cool. Plants vs. Zombies, Bejeweled Blitz, all those titles. Were so what was the environment change like? So you're going from pretty much, you know, agency, agency, you know, sales, and then you're going into, you know, looking at the platforms and, and the te technical piece. Yeah. And then you're coming into the, the gaming world when it was really starting to take off. It was really, know, really taking off. So what, what was that like in terms of environmental change? Because I, I assume you have to be quite creative in that environment. Yeah, um, you know, yeah. The people well, there's semant hiring. semantic as well, I suppose, was my first real in-house, and that was a good four or five years. So I got a lot of exposure there to the tech space. But I think the difference to hopefully answer your question yeah. is that if you're in an agency recruitment, you don't get immediate uh, like validation, recognition, these things that keep us keep me motivated anyway. Yeah. Um, whereas in house, you kind of do. It's more immediate. You feel go, a part of the whole Thanks process, and particularly um, yeah. just interviewing with Protex even recently, I said to my boss Paul, I said, he said, "What motivates you?" And I said, "Well, when you're internal and you hire someone, and three or four months later." You could be walking past somebody in the corridor and they just go, thanks for hiring Vera, Jack, whoever. Yeah. Amazing. And then that's... that's or even Vera and Jack saying thanks when you're in the, the canteen. And from the yeah. candidate perspective as yeah. well, yeah. But more so, you've had the, they've had the business impact and you're just, as me singing and dancing for about a month, you know? Cool. Um, and then obviously being in-house, you might have looked at, you know, non-technical roles and stuff like that. So yeah. do you find it, you know, more difficult to attract tech talent or tech, you know recruitment um itself because you know from my side and i'm looking at you know different parts of, of businesses and how they hire um i do find you know tech recruitment they probably delve a little bit deeper it might be you know the mindset of of um obviously people technic that are in technology are curious people uh, creative people yeah and they might look at things a little bit in depth so yeah. you know have you seen anything like that like let's say if you're hiring for you know uh, i don't know maybe an office manager or someone in the financial world or department you yeah, know, do you find that the process is different, differ at all, or you know, yeah. like in terms of conversions and everything like that, getting people over the line? I think I just wanted be... to understand that from a, a yeah. TA perspective. I think you and me are aligned. I think we're both in tech for a very clear reason: is that we probably like that problem statement that candidates yeah. present yeah. themselves with, and even if there's not a problem, sometimes they're looking for one, which can be terribly frustrating. Yeah. <laughs> um, but it's definitely the tech is known to delve in and, and provide solutions uh, to problems and they start off with the, with the problem statement which is great uh, because then we know we know our frame for how to fix things but um when you're talking non-tech roles and hiring for them yeah there isn't the same kind of default mindset it's not a negative mindset it's, it's yeah. inquisitive and curious but in in non-tech roles it's not the same 
mindset. So therefore, it's, I find it harder to navigate uh, sometimes. Like case in point at the moment, we're, we're you know trying to attack the US market and, and hiring for the salespeople and, yeah. and just calibrating the alignment on what is you know good versus great. What's a great person for that? Yeah. To me, it's a bit a bit cloudier. Yeah. I shouldn't be telling my employer. Yeah, that, anyway. <laughs> yeah. but it's easier yeah. to like what I mean by is there's set certain skills that like let's say an engineer goes to college they learn certain technologies there's always that having to upskill or get onto the next technology or you know mm -hmm. they, they need to keep upskilling while you're working but then when you go for interview you could have let's say an example would be a java developer that works with spring and aws etc so you have the you know the technology language you have the frameworks and you have the cloud yeah. but then when you go in an interview with that manager like there's more depth to it is what I'm trying to say, even from a manager's perspective. So a, yeah. a big challenge what I see, and it'd be good to get your, your view on it is, you know, certain companies that win the talent war are probably that little bit more flexible. It's really around the personality, you know, what can we actually train them up on? What do they actually need to have? Yeah. Where other roles, you know, that I've seen on the market, which, you know, haven't been in companies that you've been in, but they are a bit of maybe a shopping list. Okay. And once they get into interview, it can be, you know, they want absolutely everything and it's a little bit more depth and, and in terms of conversions, then if mm -hmm. you have, it, that's what I'm trying to get at in terms of like, if you have somebody that is like an accountant then they have like, they've done their certifications, they've, you know, worked in a, an accounting firm for so long, it, for me it looks like an easier shift than it would be for maybe a software engineer or you know data yeah. scientist or you know ai engineer do you ever see that on your end or seeing that over the years or do you on both would sides, you agree or disagree with uh, that? on both sides of the fence you see that yeah uh, this is all about this is all about us as recruiters <clears throat> um in-house particularly more as an agency it's our job to educate the hiring team on alignment and the bar if you don't have either of those two things, you're we're kind of snookered. Because we'll never get perfect alignment. And that shopping list would only just be a reason to, to, to hire out rather than hire in. Okay. So many companies with shopping lists, I think they're more concerned about not hiring than hiring. Okay. Because what I've noticed lately, and lately being the past maybe four or five years, <clears throat> excuse me, when it comes to tech, they're more focused now, 50% attitude and aptitude. It used to be aptitude 70, 80%. Whereas the most forward thinking companies, they're not tied necessarily to the stack, like you say. Yeah. Um, they do have flexibility. They work a lot more iteratively and agile in, in, in their teams and collaboratively, even in the remote sense with the, uh, the advent of COVID and before. Um, the, the ways of working have changed. So they've opened up a lot more to the attitude of an engineer than previously, I, I think. Perfect. So in non-tech roles, <clears throat> like your accountant, um, like financial controllers, I suppose the nearest thing that I probably would have hired in that, in that vein. Um, they tend to be very rounded as well, very, very commercially aware of loads of operations that I wouldn't be necessarily so privy to. Um, so once they're able to explain to me clearly what the financial commitment or liability of those operations is and what their role in it is, I'm sort of going, oh, this, yeah. if it's a natural language, it feels right, you know? Perfect. So that's more of the soft skills. So like our, our engineers, our people in tech, um, need to probably develop more so the soft skills and being able to explain it from a operational point of view and where they can add value and more yeah. so on the soft skills as opposed to explaining the, te the technical piece because yeah. well, when an interview you want to get to understand them and, and be able to you know pitch themselves pitch well. themselves yeah, yeah. Or, well, I suppose pitch or just have a real dialogue around like most most screening processes will include a code sample um, being really clear about your thoughts, I feel for a candidate anyway, being very clear about your approach to that solution or that piece of code and why it may be X, Y or Z uh, shape. Uh, being very clear about that, having a fluid dialogue around that in your interview is, is key and being honest about had, had you had more time, you would have done this or, you know, yeah. saying what, what's optimal. Um, that's, that's really helpful. Perfect. So that, that makes a lot of sense. And then like moving into the cloud environment from obviously in-prem, like what, what have you seen and is, is it, like what have you seen differently then in terms of the actual environment that you're working in? So going back to where you are. Well, it's not too dissimilar to recruitment actually. I see the, um, uh, I see the software engineering discipline with the advent of cloud uh, 
way more specialization. Yeah. Prior, prior to that, you had a web developer, and a web developer was essentially, back then, if it was in a smaller on-prem environment, they might have just been across the whole architecture, not even the stack. Work on like WordPress and... Well, everything, and data yeah. layer and everything. They were yeah. just, they were, they were building the whole thing that needs to be built as an ERP or an online system, but that web developer was trying to get everything available to a consumer. Yeah. Um, and that must have been fascinating for those guys and girls who were around doing that at the time. Yeah. It must have been amazing. And I, I, I remember when I came across them, it's, it was like reverse marketing. It was like, where do you want to work? The world's your oyster. Where, where, like, you know, open, yeah. open the phone book and where do you want to work? <laughs> yeah. Brilliant. Yeah. And the cloud then coming along, there's so many specializations across that architecture that, um, that have just made it scalable. It just made us all benefit from cloud. Of course. You know? Um, Big example, obviously, with, with the pandemic hitting and being able to work remotely and... Exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Great example. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Being deployed in the cloud, if we were, you know, 10, 10 years prior, we probably wouldn't have... We would have had a nice few months off work, let's say. <laughs> or <laughs> yeah, maybe yeah. not so nice, who knows. <laughs> but um, that's probably sustained in the technology industry because when other industries obviously had to, you know, close, uh, unfortunately, due to COVID, the, the tech industry seemed to sustain and, and grow. We've seen it in the market, you know, in terms mm. of investments and how the market then went, um, you know, especially some large companies, share price, everything went, went a bit crazy. It's um, a bit, yeah, just on that point, if you don't mind. Yeah, um, yeah of course. And I'm not having a, a dig or anything, but I know that our industry, a lot of a lot of other industries look towards tech for hiring standards and they kind of revere the operations and things that we have. So when COVID hit, they all went mad on, on hiring spree. Yeah. Um, nearly all, I'm not talking generally, but all of them. Yeah. <laughs> and, um, but a lot did, and a lot of, some, some have said guilty of over hiring, but we, it's, it's made us all quite wary of um, employers and the security angle uh, on how, how committed they are to their operations, you know? Um, yeah. Especially me and my peers and other people I've spoken to during this kind of volatile environment since COVID. <clears throat> um, it's a bit it's a bit disappointing that for all the sophistication and the applications and the things that these companies build that they can't forecast correctly around yeah. their own workforce i find that I, f I find that baffling to be honest yeah so that's yeah my, that's my yeah, dig, yeah, that's my yeah, dig. That's perfect yeah no look, look I'm, I'm in in total agreement with that and again that's that's probably for our industry as well in particular is like the value add because that a lot of it, the pieces was saying is in my opinion, was quite business focused, and it was like in terms of profitability, and mm -hmm. you know we've invested X amount of into these startups or these innovation and these you know companies. But technology is research. Technology is right. What's the next thing that can improve our lifestyle or you know whatever the problem that we may have that we we, we are trying to solve. Yeah. So that then leads me into probably you know one of the companies that you worked for, um, which were innovating in terms of data science, and um, they were really looking to look at the information that they had around their customer, the buyer patterns of the customers that you have and how do we actually, Orlando. yeah, Solando. Yeah. So how do we actually then monitorize, monitorize that life cycle to show that tech has shown the value? Because I, I do have an idea of, of what that looked like, but can you kind of explain to me what you've done in there? Because for me on the outside looking in, you had a great brand proposition. You had a great, like anybody from a data science or engineering background, were, yeah, were yeah. like you know like flies to, to light they wanted to get in there and wanted to go there so can you give us a little bit of a an insight to that journey of when you landed in there and what what you've done differently to attract talent that necessarily wasn't out there yet yeah uh, interesting it was innovative um i think first and foremost kudos to whoever came before me i joined zanando i think there's maybe about 45 50 odd people grew to 140 150 odd over the time which is a time span i think four years five years um, it was a unique brand for me, like you said, uh, because it was business to consumer. And I had a bit of B2C in Symantec days and I understood that when you're getting into that product UX, UI design, thing, that, that focus is razor sharp. That's that first and foremost has to be amazing. And we had a good bit of that in, in the Dublin team um, as well. But the uh, Zalando at that time didn't have a brand presence, so a consumer brand in Ireland. So the recruitment effort was very much just who, who are Zalando. I didn't know who they were. Yeah. I'm hardly stylish though, so that's not surprising. <laughs> but Sorry I didn't, boys, I didn't know who they were. But um, 
I knew I knew one of the, the senior engineers in there and I met him and he said, yeah, it's 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 very cutting edge. All right. And um, particularly the Dublin operation was very much around um, personalization and recommender systems. So back then it was um, a lot of machine learning around NLP, so a lot of text, uh, a good bit around image. We weren't touching video funnily enough at, at that time, I presume they are now, but um, are not to any great extent anyway that, that I recall. But the the teams were looking at the customer uh, data, like you said, the um, the metadata around the customer, where they're clicking through on the platform, where they what's happening with them, the customer yeah. information. Um, and then there was the uh, the catalogs so of all the articles of clothing themselves and their attributes. So if you think of a piece of clothing, there's you know, there's hundreds of things on with this shirt and your shirt yeah. there, to that you that people are looking uh, looking to shop for, and you have to yeah. be able to pull that up. Um, and then there was uh, there was a very kind of machine learning data science heavy function called FCP Fashion Content Platform. If any of you listen to this, you probably remember the the crazy acronyms, but um, that was really that was really interesting as well because that was trying to surface the next thing in what customers might want or else what's the most insightful thing that we can present yeah. back to them so, and let them know what they might yeah. want. So kind of predictive analytics, predictive analytics and kind of down that that very way. much, yeah, yeah. yeah. There's a lot of deep learning. Yeah. Uh, we got a couple of GPUs in there and they were delighted when another one came along because it meant better better scale of data to work with them. Uh, yeah, it was, it was uh, uh, fierce exciting. And then um, we got another merchant partner team in. We had good success, I think, hiring here locally based on the brand, like you say, especially yeah. when Z uh, Zalando launched in Ireland. Yeah. Um, but also the, the community that was there, I don't recall massive, you know, sponsored ad campaigns, no. Facebook placement things. No. LinkedIn trolling. I don't. I don't recall a lot of effort. You had a nice that. space, nice office down by the docks, if I'm not mistaken. Or where was it? Uh, uh, Grand Canal Quay. Grand Canal yeah. Quay. Yeah. Nice yeah, office space, but it's very. Parties. You know, you'd house the fence potentially. Like I don't know, but you'd have even other that's people was, coming in and house the fence. That's yeah. where you're getting. I remember that's I went to one or two myself. Yeah. Yeah. I mean that that area particularly. Like we we had grown nearly to consume the building, but we were, we were adamant that area was kept for the meetups at the time. Uh, were were integral to the hiring. I think we had a stat of thirty three percent of hires were from meetups over a twelve month period. Yeah, wow. um, and that's just there's another twenty or thirty percent through referrals, but some of the referrals might be due to the meetups as well. Yeah. Other engineers talking to other engineers, yeah. our engineers presenting talks. Um, so it was yeah. I, I don't remember too much of an outward push, but what I do remember is a really high touch, engaged team around the hiring. Yeah, yeah, and that maybe was because you had a off. strong TA function as well. Then you have like your, yourself. There was maybe a couple of people that were in the the, the TA function. Were there? Yeah, there was three of us. Yourself? Yeah. Um, at different times there was three. Other times there was two. Yeah. Um, but it was HR colleagues as well. Like everybody, kind of. I think when you're hiring well, people want a piece of that and they want to be involved. Yeah. When it's difficult, they probably run away. <laughs> yeah. <from you>. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, great, great. Um, so it brings me into then, like, what, what. Um, we we're talking about the business piece, and then like, he, how do you and, and then how do you prove value? Because that's obviously is the key statements that companies are saying about, you know, the, the realignment of of the hiring or the overhired because they forecasted X amount of sales, and those sales are not going to happen. Yeah. So it was really, in my opinion, from reading, it was really revenue business focused as opposed to what research research yeah. or what they're actually doing to bring the company forward so yeah you know like and that you know from Solando from I might be wrong was like it was mostly research development of oh. you, it was all R&D of what you were doing R&D so, engineering yeah yeah so and um, commercial exactly so where where did that then like if I'm sitting at the on the board level and I'm saying right what's happening in there and how is that then adding value to our business what what did that look like yeah a lot of a lot of trial and error I think on different initiatives that the teams would have taken up themselves, not necessarily our financial controller or anything, but there was a lot of collaboration with Berlin headquarters and teams would have gone to and fro uh, presenting their their MVP or their product that is on the platform and presenting back the value, the perceived value. Um, but at some stage, and this 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 goes back a bit to some of the, the, the founding engineering leaders who were there, uh, the Dublin site anyway, uh, at some stage they looked at a thing called, I think it was transfer pricing, 
and that involves a very complex kind of engineer uh, pushes a bit of code out. Uh, this has a value to t-shirts sold of 0 0.02 cent or whatever. It was agreed with the commercial team in headquarters that this is the value of this piece of code. And we didn't go through every line, line of code, but the team know from their own playbooks what they're releasing uh, every every week, every month. So that took, I think it took 12, 18 months maybe to put in place because it's quite a large platform, 45 million consumers, yeah. you know. Uh, but they did get it through and it changed the Dublin operation from being an absolute call center, um, millions and millions per year to run. And then it changed all of a sudden, nearly overnight once everything was signed off into a revenue generating center because yeah, we could attribute center. all that lines of code to purchases. Basically. Yeah, exactly. Because if they if the business isn't online, they're not making sales. Well, yeah, yeah. Or if you're not getting personalized personalized recommendations from an online experience. Yeah. And that was very much enriched by the Dublin team. So it kind of. Yeah. Yeah, well, I think we're all delighted with that. Yeah, you can do it a value add, and it's not like oh yeah, we're just you know another IT yeah. team, and we're a part of the operations. Part or, of. Yeah, yeah part yeah. of instead of actually being at the forefront. So. Things gimme gimme. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Yeah. But that's that's brilliant. That's that's an excellent um, story like, and, and way of looking at it. Loads of work. So. I wasn't even involved in it, but I believe it was loads. I saw the pain in their faces. It was loads of work. <laughs> yeah, there's lots of work. So you were selling the dream, bringing them in, and then they were they were getting to, they were getting get, to get, do it. Getting yeah. to do it, which is great. <laughs> but uh, that leads me into then the next, the next question that I have is, um, why do you do what you do? What, what, what do you enjoy about recruitment after all of these years? I still love it. Been it. Yeah. I still love it. It's um, like there's like any like anywhere. I think there's hard days. There's good days. But at the core of it, you're probably you're definitely actually helping people's careers. And even if it's people who aren't job seeking per se, the people who are that you're supporting, the stakeholders, you're helping them be a better employer, interviewer, manager, whatever it is. Um, that's some that's a part I think that loads of recruiters kind of forget. You're educating the hiring teams that you're supporting all the time. Brilliant. And even though sometimes they mightn't seem engaged, but they're, you've definitely helped them hire better at some stage. Brilliant. Otherwise, you shouldn't be shouldn't be in recruiting. <laughs> yeah, no, great, great. And then, do you feel like a sense of um, you know purpose? So when you're in the job and you're working away, do you feel like you know, like you said, the milestone of the the company? looking at that as a cost center to become a profitable center yeah and then you've been you know part of that and bringing that talent in do you feel like you know my purpose and i've actually done something there that you know for us you know you get as a cv you get as a candidate you place the candidate great thank you good boy <laughs> um, but do you do you get that sense of purpose of like we're on this mission and you know this is where we're looking to go to um, and yeah. do you get that sense you've of just purpose described purpose? my yeah. experience of where I am at the moment, and I only yeah. started two weeks ago. Yeah. Uh, you make decisions and you, sir, one does or I do make decisions based on that kind of purpose, mission. You get more of it in a smaller environment where you have bigger impact, but in a larger environment, you still relate to the same mission and purpose, but on it's more about scale and efficiency of operation. Yeah. Whereas on a smaller scale, it's just like, what's the absolute best we can do now? Yeah. You know, I, th uh, I think it leads back. I think it was Kennedy that went into the NASA, the space station, and he shook the hand of. Uh, I think it was a janitor there was cleaning as he went along, and he shook his hand and he said, "Okay, what what do you do here?" And he says, oh, "I'm putting a man on the moon." <laughs> so <laughs> do you know what I mean. So that's a, that's the way yeah, I look yeah. at it, and especially yeah. if I just you know, talk a small bit about my experiences in uh, in recruitment and, and especially in agency. There's certain projects and certain things that I work on that like the managers are the hire managers that we've worked with and, and place people with that just think, you know, maybe I just, you know, put somebody in there. There's certain, like you said, managers and companies that come back to me and ring me and say, thanks a million. Like, you yeah. know, you were a part of that journey and there's, you know, a good few of them have been on the, the series already. Saw that change. Um, and, you know, that sense of pride of like, you know certain systems i know one of the, the companies that we worked with if you're going to get a, grab a bus the systems that tell you now it I didn't, I didn't do fully those systems because it tells you they're one minute away and you might be five minutes waiting so uh, yeah yeah it wasn't funny but look you know i was part of the put building that development team that, that for built, the, for yeah, the bus so that is being late that's my fault <laughs> but then uh, i was able to create that real-time system that could then say right one minute away and then push out for five minutes <laughs> and that, but really yeah uh, oh, but like little things like that i think I don't know if 
if PA teams, I don't know if you know CTOs or CFOs when they're looking at actually agency mm-hmm. and in terms of our sense of purpose because when we play somebody obviously we get a fee um, for our service and what we do and I think on my side I think a lot of emphasis is, is placed on that from a, a customer perspective and then yeah as opposed to the value add piece um, mm. and what we actually you know we I'm in this industry 13 years now in agency and you know my purpose is to get um get talent and that are going to last and going to add value to your company so um that just kind of pushes on I just wanted to kind of kind of say what well, why I do and then the purpose is those little things of, yeah. of the impact that I actually have make, made um as opposed to right I place somebody and create a fee um, it's about that bottom line value thing. I think, regardless of where you're coming from, and even as a, as an employee uh, yourself, everyone wants to see how they contribute to the success of where they are. You know, I think as a recruiter in house or agency, you still have a huge dent. And I think a lot of us undermine our efforts sometimes. We're, we're yeah. you know, probably not patting ourselves on the back enough. Like it's a deadly career to be in. Yeah, it and, is. And uh, a lot of us think we don't affect the bottom line, but we affect a lot more than other contributions I, I feel I've witnessed anyway so yeah yeah and in terms of culture then like obviously TA would set a lot in the way of culture so when you're bringing people in you're probably the first person um, that, that's that been met in the in the company in terms of recruitment so oh God love them yeah yeah <laughs> <laughs> please stay please come in please join us but uh, <laughs> no like so in terms of creating the culture like how, how do you look at that like so because again you said it it's about the attitude the aptitude it's about the culture so like what are the kind of key things that you look at in in way of culture you know the environment flexibility of working or obviously yeah. you know, points but what what are the points that you like what's the phrase culture on? eats strategy for breakfast isn't it yeah yeah if your culture's not right um you know we're all herds by mentality in our in our species we we, we have a herd mentality uh by following each other or following leaders and um culture i'm not squarely blaming it it's it, it's a top and bottom approach but if your leaders, and especially your people leaders, aren't uh, seeing the value of an engaged culture, you're kind of going uphill all the time. Uh, you can influence somehow as a, sorry, as a as a recruiter. You can influence it on people you take in, and uh, but they're going to find out eventually if it's not right. Yeah. And for it to be really right, it it uh, it has to be represented at at the top level. Excellent. You know, you need something to hang your your coat on, really, when it comes yeah. to culture, and especially in a remote environment. I think that's a challenge for them as well. So it's very much down to the the middle management and and people managers then on the ways of working, yeah, and what flexibility do their leadership give them, what freedom and yeah. autonomy. So yeah, yeah, it's it's de- the culture topic has definitely changed since COVID. I feel, but it's still the same rules still apply. It's a bottom up, top down approach. Yeah. Yeah. And then obviously the, the big words and, and what's being spoken about now, like obviously one is productivity. Next one is, you know, hybrid working, remote working, back in the office. In terms of the flexibility model, like what, what do you think, um, no one knows what really works, but like what are you seeing that, you know, people want? What do what, what are you seeing from speaking to people on the ground over the last few years? Um, yeah, uh, I think tech was always kind of remote to a degree anyway, and teams who had establish those rituals beforehand before pandemic um we're probably okay it's just it was like a bump in the road um i don't i don't believe though that companies just exist on pure lines of code anyway uh like we said earlier the the aptitude of the ways of working engaging with teams is becoming more important product managers have to know how to how to woo the best out of their engineers as well and their data scientists um and that kind of information flow has to happen somewhere that's uh, fully remote, yes, but I think you'd probably get better conversations if it's yeah. off off meeting time, you know. I don't like the transactional nature of, of Zoom myself being very people driven, yeah. but I can imagine the engineers absolutely thrive and go, this is brilliant. Yeah, I know what I do here and I just yeah. fill that box, but then... Are you trying to do a line of code? Are you having some difficulty that you can just ring Zoom, share the screen and say, listen, can you, you help us with this real time if, you know, people yeah. are available so it's that connection piece that, yeah. that might be um good but um i'm definitely like hybrid is, is the word so i think it, it's getting the hybrid right um as opposed to you know going back and saying right 2018 we had everybody in the office our revenue was x or whatever because mm. it, it is a balance 
Um, and we should learn. It's just another economy. shift, though. We should learn, and we have the tools, yeah. like you said, to be able to uh, get the work done. We should learn how to get the optimal out of it, as as you know, as middle managers and as people. Um, we should learn, I think, how to how to get over that kind of remote or hybrid question dilemma. It's just, it's weird to see it still going on. Yeah, yeah. no, definitely, <laughs> definitely. So, um, and then if we're touching on um, just the the top two, three things. So the, the market. Again, it, it, it's sometimes contradictory and um, people are saying there's a skills gap and we need to get skills and then there's some really good skilled people looking for work yeah, at the yeah. moment. Um, and then obviously you have our systems, you know, X so many people applying for the roles, not just here. Um, I'm sure when you see, when you post a, a role on LinkedIn or any other platform, it might Look say- 24 hours later. Yeah, that's it. Yeah. But you might say 100 or 200 people, but then again, you might have 100 people applying from countries that cannot work in Ireland um, and, and things like that. So. Mm-hmm. What would you say are the you know top two to three things to stand out um, as, a candidate. as a candidate? So obviously we have now algorithms and everything that are pulling keywords off CVs and what's coming and looking in front of you. But let's take it back, let's say old school, when you have a CV in front of you um, and you have a job spec in front of you, what is making you want to pick up the phone and screen that person? As in, so when you look at, at, at for more than seven seconds, more than seven, exactly, seven more than more than the algorithm would. But yeah, yeah so when you're reading that, like, what 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 do you want to jump out at you? What like, firstly, is there a certain format, a layout you like to see? Um, in a CV, I think uh, most recent experience. I mean, it's real fundamental, but I think uh, it's probably fundamental to us. Pardon, it's it's yeah. not fundamental to everybody job searching. Some people haven't been job searching until this market. So yeah, uh, yeah, absolutely. Um, uh, whatever profile you have be it linkedin or whatever top of the page and a name doesn't matter where you are definitely not a photo and um, that breeds a little bit of bias we don't like that um and then experience what's your most recent experiences whether it's projects and uh, academic or whatever uh, a bit of a statement three or four lines in a statement to go on what you really enjoy doing and this goes for any level to be amazed the amount of vp level who they put in sometimes war and peace about their career at the top yeah. and you're going don't have the no, and some bits are in bold. No, yeah. still no, no, no. Three or four lines uh, yeah. about your background and purpose and things you enjoy. Uh, aside from the role, you don't say I'm looking to be a customer success manager. No, you say these are the skills and uh, what I enjoy doing and what I'd like to do. Fair. That kind of that kind of pitch, yeah. if you like. Where you are and where you want to go, get to basically. Yeah, and yeah, it's yeah. and then experience. Then experience, and is there a clear layout? So let's say we're talking about an engineer. Is there you want to see links to projects, like if if they're the have repositories, GitHub, repositories. Yeah, 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 like absolutely. What like and they, they get looked at. Don't, yeah. don't think they really? don't. <laughs> yeah, of course. Yeah. And then when you're looking at um, the actual CV, so are you comparing to the job spec? So let's take a really you know easy one for me would be a, a, a analyst. So a, a developer, but is more of an analyst in the role. Um, and you're seeing like maintaining, analyzing, etc. Where this role is for a developer, which is you know designing APIs, building you know, so wording is is a, also a big key part, isn't it, on the CV? Yeah, yeah. wording. Even, even job titles as well can 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 jump yeah. out. As you said, you're going through sometimes 100, 200 applications. So like that seven. There's seven the, to 10 you'd be seconds. amazed. A lot of engineers, my experience anyway, they haven't like the product managers do. They lead kind of with that problem statement piece. They didn't say. They don't say we had a uh, a scalability issue of X. Uh, I went in and I was responsible for Y. Had a result of Z. Yeah, like that's that's going because that shows to me they're they're dealing with other people in the team. Again, back to the maybe collaboration piece, but it shows that they have that that uh, the engineering chops that they're invited to the conversation. Yeah, they're not just said there's the box of code yeah. you fill that box so they're not on the assembly line so yeah, it depends on yeah. the company you're in as you said you're in a company now that's in, in like looking to grow looking to you know bring bring their product to market so yeah. they need someone that has been there done that war the t-shirt basically uh, well uh, yes and no i mean um they're very good for hiring on on potential which is which is refreshing to see um but i always think when you when you're scaling teams you got to have that one senior mentor type engineer for every to junior yeah of course that kind of ratio and that's what i want to get to as well so junior developers so a lot of junior developers anyone in it would look at a job spec um, on the market and it'd say junior software engineer two years experience so you're yeah. coming out of college and you're a grad 
like let's say they are grad or they are junior roles where you don't have to have any experience or maybe one year's experience how do you then stand out from that crowd what what is going to like besides getting into the realm and having that attitude yeah. what are you looking at a cv and saying right this person is, is, is are you um you stalking me no, no. I just put up mind. a junior ad last night. <laughs> so there you go. There you go. So there for, you go. Uh, for solutions engineers. So there you go. When yeah. we're sharing this, hopefully people will see it and then apply for your, for your roles directly and then they, okay. they'll be able to read, read this before you. they meet you. But uh, yeah, so what, what are you looking for anyway in, 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 in a junior in, in this particular role, we do have a senior and a manager. It's a brand new team. So they're kind of, that's what I, I find refreshing about where, where I'm at. They're not just going... Because we're a small company of 45, 50 people, we have to have, everybody's got to be top of the bar. And correctly, you should hire very, very well and hard. And they've done that already with the, the hiring that they have. So they've brought me in, so it's bound to drop now. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But, but I think for the junior, yeah. there's space in the team enough to bring Sustainability and growth, basically, yeah. yeah. There's space enough. And um, it's, it's one to two years experience, it's early careers. And I think the reason for saying one year's experience is that you have to know the work, the work environment, the cut and thrust of yeah. what product they're trying to do, what design they're trying to do, what, and not know, but you just have to have exposure to or yeah. awareness of, and yeah. that's kind of just enough. Sure. And once we've somebody like that who doesn't mind dealing with kind of break fix stuff with customers, that's yeah. the solutions engineering piece, and then you, the world will open up because it is on. AWS and everything else as well. So brilliant. It should be a good role. I'd do it if I could. That's not that's, that's great. You know, it wouldn't be all. Um, but that that's why you're recruiters. But um, yeah. what what I was gonna say then and touching on is that that graduate that is like out there applying for loads of roles. It's just not happening for them right now. Um, my two cents would be side projects. You know, get onto GitHub. Get you know, look at something that you are interested in. Can you build some code around that? Can you create your own home project yeah. and can you demonstrate that? So when you go into the the actual interview, can you stand up and be able to pitch and say, well, this was the, the problem, this is what I was looking to solve, or this was the application, this is what I was looking to yeah. build. And um, for me, I think that that stands out that little bit more. Is that is that kind of something that you would like to see? Because you, know, you have yeah. to stand out from the crowd. And for me, with no experience, you have to show some project work or something that you've done. Maybe you've been in college and you extend yeah. it to complete it. This um, the case in point, I think last week we did expect it to be talked to a junior individual who had um, uh, was using the computer vision tool pose estimation, and it's kind of right up our street. Uh, and it was it was very interesting. So the the head of engineering said, "Oh yeah, I'll definitely chat with him." So um, and that's still still underway. Um, but that's kind of very opportune. I think for those individuals who don't have experience but definitely have the passion and they identify the companies that they would like to work in or think they'd like to work in. And if they're able to, uh, I'd physically go along to their meetups. Yeah. I mean, if, if Solando hired the best of talents from a lot of meetups, yeah. there's no, there's no reason here. to think that the, the, the brand new talents coming into market can't avail at the same channel. Yeah, no, oh, definitely. Uh, and then you'd buy, even if you don't get jobs out of that, you're definitely gonna learn something and you're definitely going to have maybe your mind broad and go, do you know what, I actually really like to do that. So we've gone to the meetups and see what topics they're ML, whatever it might be that they're interested in, going to go into those kind of meetups or events or online events. But certainly, certainly the physical ones, I think people are more open to the networking area, you know. Yeah, excellent, excellent. And it'd be silly for me not to have you sitting here beside me today and not ask you the question of, where do you see where agencies can add value or not? <laughs> um, but now where would you see if you're you're sitting there and you're saying, right, agencies are looking at leads, they're looking at opportunities, they're you know yeah. get, trying to get information and, and trying to get in front of you. Um, let's say like where do you see agencies can add value to you, and where a TA team or you know maybe you're a company that don't have the TA function and stuff like that set up. Um, but in yeah. your opinion, where, like you worked in agency, it, you know, yeah. in, in the early days. So, like, where do you see, uh, basically, where agency can add value to you and your organization, and what what does that look like? Oh, I think any third party, well, whatever shape it is, embedded or bo agency, it's third party. Um, pardon my naivety, but um, yeah. uh, for me, it's definitely in the area of spike. Uh, so, if we today said we need five x. Uh, I can't take that on, team can't take that on, uh, or we have to uh, 
offhand some of our other stuff or other requisitions we might be working on to focus on that five building brand new team uh, I see I see agency purely as extension or on a confidential search as well um, yeah obviously for whatever extenuating circumstances there might be for confidential um, that's, that's senior kind of management C level stuff like that that you might need to yeah yeah somebody. sensitive yeah. Um, or and then if it's uh, I don't see it for niche I think I think carving out niche and agency is is really important like you'll have your different teams and your functions and your disciplines and first of all you got to know your market to be a good recruiter I think as we said before we started yeah. chatting on camera yeah but um but yeah definitely knowing your market and having those disciplines really really deeply known and then just talking to companies that use your discipline yeah like to get uh, approaching a company saying we are Hayes or whoever else and we have all these functions but should, I might only be working, use, have use for two or three. Yeah. So that kind of tailorism is, yeah. is good. Yeah. Tailorism, so is that a word? Yeah. <laughs> we created it anyway. So, uh, but yeah, tailorization, I suppose, maybe that's a word. But uh, yeah. looking at tailoring your, your service. Yeah, listen, that, that's that's what most, I think, companies do now is to be experts in, in a certain area. Like for ourselves, we cover you know, every department within the IT environment. Yeah. And, um, and I'm not to be salesy on that at all, but I think that's an alignment of, of market and showing value. But I think for you, if you're being, you have a project and you have X amount of roles and you know you're going to be inundated, it's mm. for agency to filter that, screen the candidates, you yeah. know, save you time basically. Yeah. Um, and yeah, and time, you know time to hire if you need somebody in now or, you know, again, in contracting world as well, you might have a project that's worth X. And if you don't get people in to fulfill that, your customer you know, may walk away or you may lose X amount of revenue. 100%, yeah, yeah, so 100%, it's it's very good. Filling yeah. that gap. Yeah. Um, and best recruitment process. So we, it, great question. It's a hard one. We keep um, it on tech or we keep, all roles? Yeah, yeah, yeah no, so just best recruitment process. What do you found work for you? You spoke about events and everything like that. So um, yeah. on an agency side, we always say time kills all placements. So the longer you go, and it, it's just factual, if you have a really good candidate, they're going to pretend, and they're actively looking, they're going to be interviewing potentially with multiple different customers. Yeah, funny enough, in-house, it's the opposite. Okay. The longer the longer you take on a search, and it's, it's desperate, nobody, everybody's saying no, but sometimes yeah. the longer you search, the more likely you are to get maybe a diverse candidate or maybe, uh, you know, for other areas of the yeah. company that might suit, so. Yeah. And that's really interesting that yeah, you say that because yeah. that's where I was trying to get at earlier yeah. in terms of time to hire. So yeah. we were looking at certain roles, talking about finance and we're talking about tech. Sometimes the managers are looking for that process to be a two, three month process because they want to see what comes into their pool. Yeah. Um, as opposed to, right, this system needs to be built here now or there's a, an issue with the application and we need to you know, get people in to, to check I, it. I think as a recruiter, quality. we want we want quicker turnaround all the time. Yeah. There is nothing worse, absolutely nothing worse than a, a lack of alignment. Yeah. I, took, I think it was in a company once and anyone watching probably knows that the person that we did hire in the end took nine to 12 months. Okay. There was a lack of alignment from above, a lack of alignment from interviewers, a lack of alignment before you even start and they're like saying, oh, this person's really good and the other person's saying, no, it's not. Yeah. And it's crazy, it's very frustrating for a recruiter. So um, yeah, alignment is, is just absolutely critical. Brilliant. <laughs> um, and then that's the saving your time because as well in the the HR function or different functions, you're obviously quite technical. You've you've been in technology for a long time. You started out in technology and, and you've evolved your, your career and you've sat with hiring managers. You've seen how everything works. So you are quite technical. But then looking from a non-technical perspective. So again, if you're a HR person and you, you know, have to do so much things and you're not really, you're limited in terms of the technical Mm. background like so is is that as well if you were in that seat would you find that then as a, a value add that agencies could bring to you if they're an expert yeah. in java or maybe python data engineers or you know maybe aws cloud where you can then you know would you see a blocking point so where your hr and saying right can, should I get that agency to talk technically with the manager so then they know what they're looking for? Like, So this is where I'm Absolutely. trying to understand the full process. Yeah. You have a blank canvas. What would you do then to fill a role? You have a, a software engineer. What would you do? Yeah, okay. I'll answer your original question. Yeah. yeah. Um, so from, from start, great brand to start, of all, start off, like you say, uh, recruiter screen, um, and the recruiter at this stage will have eliminated who he or she doesn't think is relevant. Uh, recruiter screen, um if progressing hiring manager interview if progressing code base either take home or code live 
um, preferably my recommendation code live and review, but that's always up for debate depending on yeah. the role. And then after that, uh, uh, a peer or leadership depending on the role interview. Cool. Yeah. So two to three rounds, um, yeah. but you get yeah people in. I think that's that's the norm. That's yeah. really what looking people to see. Um, is there one bit of advice that you'd give to TA and recruiters? So looking back on the last few years, you won't give exact numbers. You yeah. may have given it already, but looking back, is there any advice that you'd give to fellow TA people, maybe starting out, have experience, recruiters? Yeah. What What would be your advice to them? Never reach out and say you. You probably missed my previous email. Never say, even anyone not in recruitment, never say, you probably missed my previous email. Don't make assumptions. Okay. Because you make that person like a fool. Um, and people do read emails. They just say, oh, I never read it, but people do. Or they read Slack, or they read, they read stuff that comes in. People do read yeah. it. Um, as a recruiter, as a TA folk, I think I kind of said at the outset, it's a brilliant career. It's very, very satisfying if you so choose to pursue it. Like, uh, I think it's it's most rewarding if you're if you're probably more people driven than tech driven or anything like that. But the best thing about it so far is it's, it's split off into so many different disciplines. I think like cloud as well, when it brought in yeah. so many different skills, it has actually split off. You have sourcing, you have TA ops, you have, you have exec search, you have, there's loads of different areas now in recruitment to get into. Yeah. And we can't be great at all of them. Yeah, of course. So the bits you're shit at are really bad at. Just do them first thing in the morning because the rest of the day is bound to be nice. Exactly. Yeah, no, that's good. And then with TA and, and obviously recruiters, it gives you a great opportunity. Like if you're, I got in, in quite young, um, you know, when I started out in recruitment and you know, I'm sure you obviously got in quite young as well when you yeah. were in recruitment. So it, it can give you a tool to travel. Like, so if you look at certain trades or certain industries, like, yeah. you know, nearly every country are going to be hiring. So mm -hmm. it gives yeah. you a great tool to travel. As you spoke about going back and you know, you were going to be a language teacher and you, you were thinking yeah. about going to Japan and stuff like that. So. I've worked in Australia, I've worked in the States as well. Yeah. So. In recruitment, so. Yeah, yeah. So. It's, it's similar. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Different markets, different, different, different markets. way. Yeah, well. Hard to get your head around. I don't, scale, scale was hard to get your head around both places, yeah. Okay, okay, brilliant. Um, and then for the very last question, um, which is probably one of my favourite questions because I always then look at the books or look at the films or look at podcasts that people are listening to or oh, right. what they're doing. Is there any favorite book that you have? Is there any podcast? Is there any film or really good series potentially on Netflix that I might, <laughs> might look at? So uh, it doesn't need to be yeah. educational, just, just something fun, what you like to kind of do in your, your spare time. I know you have a, a young family as well, but uh, yeah. outside of that. The, the duck in the pond. Oh no, sorry. No, no. <laughs> um, yeah. uh, I, I don't read, and, and to my detriment probably, I don't actually read a lot of work. The last workbook I read was um, a Newsweek reporter, and he went in undercover into uh, a CRM company, who shall re remain nameless, uh, yeah. and it was like a satire, uh, Disrupted is yeah. the name of it. Very, very good. Brilliant, brilliant. And just, he went into the culture and, and, and how, how bonkers it all was. And then, um, I think for a recruitment perspective, the... The weekly from Hong Lee is the recruiting brain food. I find myself, that comes out on Sunday evenings, I find myself just getting lost in that. Adam Gordon is another good guy who interviews about recruiter enablement. Okay. Do maybe a podcast with him, be very good, because yeah. he'd have a lot of uh, better answers probably for you than I have. I don't know. But, um, but yeah, recruiting brain food is another one from Hong Lee. Excellent. Brilliant, yeah. brilliant. And then outside of your own time, then like in kind of podcasts or any podcast that you're like listening to, I'm, I'm kind of in the podcast world. I don't know if, you, if it's something well, like that. I find Blind Boy in. fascinating. No, I never listened to it. Blind him. Boy, yeah, podcast. Yeah, he's, um, he was the the lead singer of the Rubber Bandits and he's a bag on his face, but he yeah. seems to be getting very good, interesting people on board. And he, yeah. he, um, he tackles a lot of topics that people mightn't be, or people might be afraid to tackle, you know? Yeah. That's always good. Yeah, it's healthy. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Very good. Brilliant. Well, Owen, listen, it was brilliant to sit down with you. I know you're busy starting off and and uh, Protex and and working away um, yeah. at the roads and, and building out something great there. Hopefully, um, and yeah. continue to be great. Fifty heads already. Um, so we wish you the best of luck with that. And uh, thanks again for your time. Really appreciate Likewise, it. Likewise, Jason. These, these things are always worth taking time out for. You know, and, it's, and thanks for having us. Yeah, physically in the offices. Very good. Very uh, enjoyed that. Always reach out if you need me to comment on anything further. I will indeed. Thanks. Yeah. Cheers. Thank Cheers. you.